CJD Foundation. The helpline at the CJD Foundation receives more than 100 calls a month from people who need information and support. creutzfeldt jakob disease is a mysterious, frightening, devastating illness. We need to know more about it, how it occurs, when to suspect the diagnosis, and how to respond when a case is discovered. These people have all lost loved ones to creutzfeldt jakob disease, and we can learn from their experiences. We had no clue what was happening. We just knew that he was complaining about loss of vision and loss of memory. Our family has the familial form of CJD, and we've lost 12 members now over five generations, the first one hitting my generation just last year. And I'm telling you that every day, every day that he would wake up and I would come down and we would sit together, I saw less and less of my husband there. It takes away everything that makes you human and it does it in like a split second. All the attendants that came in to attend to him, they'd all put on a disposable schmuck and a face mask and gloves and we're all sitting there in our street clothes, you know. He looked at himself in the mirror and he said, don't they know what I've got? And I said, well, they're still testing, and they were. And he said, they must know something. And I said, well, they say you have a brain disease. He said, did I catch it? And I said, no, it's just in your brain. And he said, how long have I got? Don't they know what I've got? They must know something. Did I catch it? How long have I got? These questions are difficult for physicians as well as for patients and their families. I'm Dr. Peter Ostrow, neuropathologist at the State University of New York at Buffalo and the Jacobs Neurological Institute. In this program, we'll explore creutzfeldt jakob disease and the related disorders known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. This program offers several options. There's a main presentation which can be viewed from start to finish, or you may pause during the presentation and select key topics to explore in greater depth. Continuing medical education credit is available through online registration or a printable form. Several experts have collaborated with us in this production. Dr. Richard Johnson is a Distinguished Service Professor of Neurology at Johns Hopkins. He chaired the Institute of Medicine Committee that was charged with providing guidance for the National Prion Disease Research Program. Dr. Richard Knight is Director of the United Kingdom's National CJD Surveillance Unit in Edinburgh, Scotland. Dr. Robert Will is Professor of Clinical Neurology at the University of Edinburgh and Founding Director of the UK's National CJD Surveillance Unit. Dr. Pierluigi Gambetti is Director of the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center in Cleveland. He is also Medical Director of the CJD Foundation. These international leaders will provide a comprehensive consideration of prion disorders. We'll review the history of spongiform encephalopathies and how their transmissibility was first elucidated. The fact is, in retrospect now, most people think that Kuru probably did start as a spontaneous case of creutzfeldt jakob disease occurring in a tribal group, an isolated tribal group, that practiced endocannibalism. We'll illustrate how the misfolding of prion proteins and the ability of an abnormal protein to cause the misfolding of others explains the pathogenesis of these diseases. Differential diagnosis, including the use of various diagnostic tests, will be presented through case studies of patients with various types of prion diseases, sporadic, familial, and acquired. We'll also look at the fear factor and some of the myths and misconceptions that surround these disorders, especially about how they're spread. Now, I appreciate that sporadic CJD is not an infection, but you can, in principle, catch sporadic CJD, and certainly some forms of the illness, like variant CJD, clearly have been and are transmitted by some form of ordinary process in ordinary life. And I think that people have become primitively afraid of infectious disease. This is not a communicable disease in the usual sense. Is it transmissible? Yes. We as doctors have transmitted it. We've done it with growth hormone, we've done it with dural grafts, we've done it with unsterile surgical tools. And so that, that has happened. And that, of course, makes people say, my God, it's infectious. Doctors, as well as patients. Misconceptions need to be addressed, both within the medical profession and among the general public. We also need to help patients' families cope during a diagnostic workup. Uh, my frustration with this whole disease was having no answers. I figured we took him to the hospital, he'd be fine. 
they'd find it. He'd be okay. I think sometimes, in my experience, families are quite angry that the diagnosis has been delayed. But the reason for that is that this is not an easy diagnosis to make in some cases. In Often it can be very difficult in the early stages because there are far more likely alternative possible diagnoses. We don't yet have a simple lab test on CSF or on blood that can establish a definitive diagnosis. Only brain biopsy can do that. And in most cases, brain biopsy is not an attractive option. I think the more realistic solution would be, practical solution would be to learn how to diagnose these diseases very, very early. And that I think could be done. When a patient with probable CJD succumbs to the illness, examination of tissue is very important. Physicians and families should be aware of the availability of autopsy and the services offered by the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center. Autopsy are extremely important because it's the only way we can classify cases. We can identify whether the, a case can really pose a threat to public health. And that is the ultimate uh, goal and mission of the, of the surveillance center. The CJD Foundation aids the surveillance center in that mission, and they collaborate in providing information and support to help physicians and families deal with this tragic disease. We work with nursing homes, with hospices, with funeral homes. Anytime there's a problem and they've called us, we either can answer it we get, or we get the answer or we refer them to some place where they can get the answer and we follow up. We always follow up. You like to think that you could make at least what is a terrible situation a bit better or at least not as bad as it might be just by the way you deal with it and by being able to give people information and answer the questions and relieve their uncertainties and fears about it. The goal of this program is to provide information and resources that will help clinicians recognize and deal with these diseases. We hope you'll find it useful.